The church is like none other group. Any other group you can call an organization, but as Pastor Brett has mentioned many a time, a church is not an organization, it is an organism. Welcome to Encore, where we continue the conversation around the Word of God. We are here ready to discuss the sermon entitled, Paul's Strategy for Growth. Paul's Strategy for Growth, I've got Tim Perry with me, Aaron Weens with me. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. All right. Well, we're going to get into this subject matter of Paul's strategy for growth. Many churches go to great lengths to come up with their strategy for how they're going to grow their assembly. And Brett, Pastor Brett was posed with this question by a, from my understanding, prospective member. Uh, looking in, from his view, he couldn't understand what is our strategy. <clears throat> And uh, Brett decided to turn that into a sermon. My question to you is, uh, what did you take from it, or what uh, stood out most to you in this? Let's start with, I'm going to start with Tim. All right, very good. No, I think, you know, I, sitting under Brett's teaching and, and the way that he presents things, it's, it's all, it's so biblically based that numbers don't drive Brett, I guess that's my perspective. I mean, maybe you guys disagree with that. But he wants a, a solid uh, instruction, teaching to take place. And I look at it more of a, as, a, as a spiritual growth rather than a numerical. And I know they can go hand in hand at times. But I can only speak for myself and, and to say that, um, I mean, I've grown spiritually when I understand how to study the Word. Mm -hmm. how to, how to uh, correctly divide the word. And that, for me, is, is an individual type of growth. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, that when you talk about Paul's strategy for growth, I mean, it, is it just numbers? Or is it, I mean, really understanding the, the truth of Scripture and to be able to, to digest that and to apply not only to your own life, but you can, you can teach it to your family to someone you're discipling, uh, maybe you're teaching a class, maybe you're, you know, whatever the pastor or maybe a deacon board asks you to do, but can you take those things and, and grow, um, I guess, teach the growth that you've learned? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think, too, I when, I when I think about growth, we've kind of been talking about this in our Sunday school class a little bit. Uh, we're in First Peter. In fact, Brett mentioned First Peter. Um, um, for one of his references, but I want to go back to Matthew sixteen eighteen that says, "And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." Um, our Sunday school class is the older class, if you will, the, the <laughs> final class of Wildwood Baptist, <laughs> and we were we have a lot of uh, former. Catholics, if I can say it like that, that, that were reared and, and grew up in, in a Catholic home and a Catholic teaching. And the conversation we had a couple weeks ago in our class uh, was to me mind-blowing because this verse is totally taken out of context. It is. And to say that Peter is the rock that Christ is going to build his church on. And almost everybody in our class that has grown up in that said, no, wait a minute. We know that's not true, but that's what was taught. Mm -hmm. And that confusion uh, was some, a hurdle for some to have to get over. Uh, but it clearly says in, in 1 Corinthians 10.4, I mean, this is a reference to Moses striking the rock, but it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that context, very clear, the rock was Christ. Well, it's the same rock Yes, Christ is referencing um, in Matthew. So I guess in, in talking in our class, it was very interesting. And for me, it's always enlightening to, to speak to people that have come out of those misteachings and those misunderstandings um, and, and to really understand what Scripture says about, I mean, that's just one example. Um, but we had a very good discussion about that. And I think... 
Christ is going to grow his church, but he's the rock, he's the foundation. And if you guys have thoughts to that, I, I have another concept I want to throw out on it, but if you guys have some things, I don't want to hog the show here. <laughs> As a side note, I always thought Moses uh, got a bad rap. Uh, that's a bad pun for this, but a bad rap. Because <laughs> he didn't know what the prophecy was. And so many times, you know, he did it again. And he's like, what the heck? What's going on? And I always felt like, no, if he would have known, he would have got it. But he, there's no way he knows. So sure. that's my little side note. I always thought Moses had a little rough there. Yeah. <laughs> One strike in the rock. <laughs> the second time. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. You confuse that and obviously you miss you misapply the understanding of that rock and it did it that was it for Moses that was the um, the end of his ability to he could see the promised land but he was now not going to enter in but you also think about yeah a lot of Catholics have tripped over this but think about how much diversion that is that has brought onto that whole system just misunderstanding that one thing, how it's, uh, yeah, it's just a little, just a little off. Oh, no, 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 down the way. And, and several centuries later, listen, we're, we're so far off from the mark. And it's, um, it's disconcerting to see, to see someone misapply scripture like that and the, the effects of it. But the other thing that stood out to me that you were just touching on was, when you're growing as an individual, it's hard to contain it. If it whether it's you're taking a class, um, I'm talking even outside of the church atmosphere, you're in an environment where you're growing, I've noticed something that happens. As a natural result of experiencing genuine growth in your life, you're not going to keep it to yourself. You're going to go out and tell someone that, hey, when I was attending Bowling Green State University, I never had the chance to attend this class. There was a class on assertive, being more assertive, and it was the most popular class. And you just, if you didn't schedule it two or three semesters in advance, you just weren't getting in. Mm -hmm. It was that popular. Mm -hmm. And it was because people were talking about what was happening in their life during that time period. If someone is in a classroom environment where they're growing, because so many classes, you're just going through it for the motions to get a certificate, when genuine growth happens, it's going to be shared. And so, but as a natural result of people being excited about experiencing growth, they're sharing it with other people and they're saying, hey, that doesn't sound like my assembly, or hey, that sounds like an environment for which I want to be a part. And so, as a result of individuals spiritually growing, we all of a sudden experience numbers because people are leaving and they're saying, man, I've, I've never heard preaching or teaching like this. Sure. And so as a result of exactly what you're saying, it does start on that level. It does start with the members in particular and learning about, not, learning about the Word of God and learning about your relationship with God, but then also in light of our main passage, which in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues, are all apostles and are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers, have all gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? And the answer to those questions is no, they don't all but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I shew unto you a more excellent way. These, you learn about all of this stuff in context of who you are in particular, and you get the opportunity to serve, and it's a powerful thing. One other little comment I want to make, and then I'll turn the conversation back over, but you kind of got me on a, <laughs> thinking about this. <clears throat> so really, one of the reasons we're growing as individuals in this church is because of something Brett said in the, in the message is that he's going to preach the whole counsel of God. And when you're not being, when you are a church that chooses not to be selective on, oh, this passage is going to offend, so my numbers are going to be affected. Yes, actually, it's going to be affected in the wrong way. What, we, what you want is someone that's going to teach on all aspects of this book. Um, that pertains to all of life and godliness 
so that you can grow, so that you can get what you need, so that you can fill those gaps and voids. And it's just a natural result that people go out and share that. I don't know if that's been your experience as well. If you've been a part of a great learning environment, you're going to share it. It's, it's interesting. I want to circle back to something you said. And, and you read the, the key passage that Brett mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12. First apostles, secondarily prophets. Coming back to our Sunday school again. Again, I, I can't make this stuff up. I'm the only, I think God can put this together. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, it's the first one that was mentioned, and the prophets, that was the second one that was mentioned in Brett's passage, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And we spent a lot of time in class this week, and I brought my prop. This is my, this is the cornerstone, okay? Okay. I got to get it out here. And we, we spent a lot of time talking about what a cornerstone was historically and what, I mean, the position of that had to be dead on. And Christ is the cornerstone. In fact, in, in the New Testament, it refers to him as the chief cornerstone. So everything comes off of that. And you said a couple minutes ago, Ed, that a little bit of teaching is a little bit off, off, off. Well, wait a minute. Mm. If, you, if you don't stay true to the corner, yes. down the road, you're going to have a problem with that. And Christ being the cornerstone, okay, the prophets and the apostles, they were all used, but they all referenced this. You know, and, and I think when, when you look at us trying to grow, if we, if we stay true to measuring off of the cornerstone, yes. we will not go wrong. We can't. But if we go off of someone else's teaching, someone else's philosophy or whatever of church, then we're going to be off because they're not coming off of that cornerstone. And I think that's why, I, oh, I mean, it's just my opinion, but I think that's why they use the word chief cornerstone. You know, that is the ultimate corner we have to focus on. Um, so it was a good analogy because the, the end of that passage says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. You know, we're talking about growing. And if we want to do that, we've got to focus on the cornerstone. Mm, well put. Fantastic analogy. So I'll, I'll now let go of my uh, discussion. I'll turn it over to you guys. Wow. That's, those, that's good. Even threw a nice little pun in there. Well, you know. We'll be able to build off that. That's ah, good. Very good. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, hmm. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. But then it says this, and this is your point, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you're going to see that clearly through Scripture, that the foundation is indeed Jesus Christ. And I think you, yeah, that, that might be one of the best descriptions of that passage I've heard, that that's going to resonate with me for a while. I really appreciate the way you shared that. Other thoughts? <clears throat> the whole counsel guide is, is something that I think does separate Wildwood because it's challenging. I, I think it's going to be very difficult to come to grips with yourself or your pride or your ego and not be challenged. Just because your ears aren't itched, are not going to be itched through the whole counsel guide when you hear it here. And, and, and that's what's so unique about it, is that the whole counsel of God is, it's not easy, but it's simple. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's not difficult, but it is hard. And there's very distinct differences between those two. Yeah. And, and I think that it, a lot of people, I think, that would come visit Wildwood would have not necessarily had an awful experience at whatever church they went to but they're at a point where they want to grow. Mm -hmm. And a certain spiritual maturity will happen when you want to be challenged, when you're opening up yourself to say, how can I grow closer to God? And, and that's going to be a challenge. And it's not going to be a walk in the park. Uh, it's going to take some life changes. Uh, otherwise, you just are sort of at a point where you want to have your ears itched. Uh, so that's something that I think 
Tim and, and you both talked about about you know, Wildwood being listening to the whole council. Yeah. It's really important. <clears throat> we also, as we do that together, we bond together. Mm. Um, anyone that goes through an experience together, especially if it involves any level of hardship or difficulty, there is a uniquely tighter bond between those. And so this fitly joined together, yes, it's elements of a building coming together and coming together perfectly fit in a joint, but it's beyond that in that, hey, we've been on the mission field together. We've, we've um, labored together to, to get the word out in our community. We're praying for one another and we're praying for the same people collectively. And as a result of that, of, a, of hearing the whole counsel of God being challenged in those ways and then continuing conversations outside of church, like this is healthy, really healthy stuff. There are some assemblies where when church is over, there's just not spiritual conversation and that's just not the case here. There's an awful lot of it. It made me think of something. I'm going to pull something up on my phone. This is a conversation from this evening from a member of my Sunday school class who has had a visitor that's made their way to church the past few weeks. Um, the, this particular lady's son just got saved today. Mm. And she, the mom, is considering, should I follow in the footsteps of my 8-year-old son? And she's, she's right there. She's right there. And... Well, I, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds and sharing this, and I don't think so. But one of the things that, that uh, was shared about this particular individual, she said one thing she said that sticks out is that we all seem like a big family and that our faith seems passionate, and she wants to be like that mm. too. Mm. So here we're talking about you don't have a real growth strategy. Well, our growth strategy is what the Bible has put forth. It's what Paul used. And naturally, as a result of people growing and being excited around one another and being excited about being rooted and, and, and growing up in the, together in the faith, someone from the outside is coming in and keeps coming back the past three weeks in a row and was almost distraught with the fact that she something in her schedule might not have allowed her to make it back. Mm. But that's what she sees from the outside. Mm. And it is a one of these things, again, well, naturally, we're going to grow when people come in and they see our love for one another. Yeah, yeah it's interesting when you, when you take the main passage of Sunday morning in 1 Corinthians 12, if you go back, and I, I won't read them, but if you look at verses... 14 to 26, everything leading up to what Brett was talking about. Just the first sentence of that passage, for the body is not one member but many. And I can remember years ago uh, in a class, um, there was a, it was all on 1 Corinthians and the, the material that was used was, was, a, was a, a cutaway of the torso of a body and exposed was a, just a ton of gears and they were all linked together kind of thing. And the concept was, you know, we as a church, we're all linked together, you know, as you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we gotta keep it oiled, we gotta keep things moving. And you know, some gears are larger, some are smaller. It doesn't matter. Everybody in the body has a, has a purpose. And I think Brett was really challenging at the end. He says, man, you need to understand your, your purpose here. You know, do what you're supposed to be doing. You know, don't don't be sitting on the fence here. We all have a role to play. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, that's our ultimate destination, obviously. But we're already there. Mm -hmm. Are we living like it? You know, are are we all geared up? You know, <laughs> as a body and doing the things that we ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. Not every not everybody's the same. But to testimony of your you know of your of your text that you got today. I mean, they saw things in people. Who was it? I don't know. I mean, they just some kind of a draw, something that they witnessed. But everybody had hands in that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You know that um, there was obedience there, yes. and um, I don't know that was the result. When you say everybody had a hand in that, this particular member mentioned this person and said, "Hey, this my this my son has been talking to this other kid on the baseball team." 
and there's been a witnessing opportunity. Mm -hmm. My son is actually witnessing to this other kid, and now he's interested in coming into church, and now the mom's asking questions. Will you pray about this situation? And so our entire Sunday school class has been a part of the prayers for this, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it took a couple weeks for her to make it, and she eventually did, and yes, everyone did have a hand in it, and I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when it says in verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another saith, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Hmm. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Hmm. And that, that is the perspective. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive of his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Hmm. Like it just brings everything we were talking about together into one statement. This statement be never became more, or it came more alive in my life coming back from the two trips I made to Hungary. Each one of those trips, if I could just summarize in a passage, I would have to go here. I would look and I would see kids, I would see members of our church working with Hungarian orphans over here. And in order to keep these kids engaged in the conversation around the Word of God, over here, there's a group of other people that are keeping these people occupied. And then there's another group of our members off to the side praying because they're seeing what's happening. Every time we looked, different people were in different roles with the people that they were entrusted to at various witnessing times. And so there were times when we were literally off to the side saying, let's pray for them because I think they're witnessing right now. Mm. And then there would be other times where I would be witnessing to someone and I look back and they're like, man, we were praying for you. Like, we knew that was happening. Like, how exciting is that to be a part of the watering, mm. to be a part of the planting, and then to see God give the increase. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was, I used to say that was the mission field. Mm -hmm. But we know that locally it's a mission field and because of our failings efforts, mm -hmm. I see that. Even more so because every time I turn around, someone's asking about, hey, how are you coming with your friend? And it supersedes our failings groups. I'm praying for people that aren't in my failings group because we're, we're all one. We all fit together. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Like, how can you, that's it. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Are there any final thoughts? I mean, that's a, that's a great passage to end on, but I don't want to rob anyone of any thoughts that are on your mind. A body is, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, synonymous for a team. And I, I remember, and even though I wouldn't say that Brett yells, the counsel of God is hard, right? And, and a very similar analogy is, I was always worried about a coach that didn't yell at me. You always be careful about the coaches that didn't yell at you because I was told, and it's true, because um, I've had both, the ones that don't yell at you really don't care. you got to be worried when they don't care. And if you use swap the word yell for preach hard, or counsel of God is hard, <laughs> man, everything starts lining up. You have a team with a coach that just gives you all the good parts of it, and then when you hit adversity, are you really prepared as a team? Just same thing goes for preaching. If you have a, a, a pastor that preaches hard, prepares you for adversity so that you can work better as a team, it's going to be a, a different organization any way you look at it. It's, it's so true. You, you took me back. There were a lot of things that we did not anticipate happening when we, when we get in on a mission field. Um, things aren't exactly as you, hey, here's what we planned for, but these aren't uh, the, the accommodations we're going to be staying in. Oh, it's not a three-star hotel? No. <laughs> Those dirt floors are not a three-star three -star hotel. Like, it just, it's totally different. But the one observation I made, because the, the train was already in motion when I came. The, it was the second year going to Hungary was the first year I made it. And... 
one of the things I noticed is the things were not, the accommodations were not great. Um, we had to fill in a lot of gaps. Things where we, we planned things a certain way and they didn't go that way. But I never heard a complaint. Not one. Everybody made adjustments. No one said, man, these rooms are really hot. Like, no one got up. That, that wasn't the source of the conversation. And it's because, I think, what you said. Our pastor prepared us for adversity. And I even saw leadership in motion. Hey, if somebody's going to give up a room, I'll stay in this, in this, um, in this lounge room. My, me and my family can stay in the lounge. I, I remember Brett making decisions like that on the fly. And like, hey, if we only got three or four fans, our fam my family doesn't need it. And those were the kinds of things that everyone was doing consistently on that. And it's exciting to see that, that, that in our local community, People are coming in from the outside and they're observing that. Mm -hmm. And so that's our encouragement to you. Paul's strategy for growth is literally just to follow the biblical blueprint. blueprint. Do not do what an organization is doing because we're a live organism. And just a couple of final thoughts. <clears throat> Things that are alive grow. Pastor Brett said that, and I think that's a, that's a really good way to think about the the energy and the excitement that we're experiencing <clears throat> and I think because of the way that we're operating I'm going to mention one other quote he gave he said you you, you got to be careful to not take something that was meant to be a calling and turn it into a career mm -hmm. and I think what people are seeing from the outside as they come in is that the people in here not just the pastor but everyone's called to a ministry and because we are and because we're a part of a body that's functioning as one, we're going to experience growth God's way.